For Criminal Media's Policy, I'm Sane Lamini, former prosecutor for the NPA and DAMP, Glynis Breitenbach, discusses her memoir titled Rule of Law. You are one of the most interesting people in Parliament, but very little is known about your personal life. Tell us about yourself and how you came to be who you are today. As we kind of you to say that I'm interesting, I think there are a lot more interesting people than myself in Parliament. Um, and about myself, there's really not a lot to say. I'm a, I'm a member of Parliament for the Democratic Alliance. I'm the Shadow Justice Minister. I've spent my entire adult life in the criminal justice system. Uh, I believe in it passionately. I want to fix it. And uh, I believe firmly in the importance of our constitution and the rule of law. And, uh, and Parliament gives me the platform that you need to to try and address the things that are wrong in our criminal justice system. Your grandmother disclosed that she was Jewish just before she died because she said it had not been safe to reveal this fact before. Can you tell us more about this? Well, I, I can't really because I don't know much about it. Um, um, as I say, my grandmother was very, very ill and she died three days later. Uh, she was in a coma for most of that time. She was very, very unwell and uh, it wasn't a, a subject that I could traverse with her. Um, so I managed to establish from my godmother, who was my grandmother's, or my mother's cousin, but quite a bit older than her, um, that my grandmother's mother had uh, come from, originated in Lithuania, had left uh, in the early 1900s during the pogroms, and that uh, a large portion of their family had been uh, had been wiped out in, in, in that time. So that probably informed her decision that it wasn't safe. Yeah. For many years you made your name as a public prosecutor. Tell us about your years in this role. Well, I was a public prosecutor for uh, 26 years. It's, uh, in my view, the best job in the world. It's, uh, it's a job that allows you to help people every single day uh, you can make a difference in people's lives every single day if you do it properly of course um, prosecuting is a great job if you can do it honestly at the moment it's very difficult to do it honestly uh, because of the the political situation in the country and the and the fact that the national prosecuting authority has certainly been captured um, along with the police to a very large degree and any other uh, in independent institutions with an investigative capacity have all been compromised. Uh, so it's very hard to do that job well or honestly, although that being said, there are thousands of prosecutors who go to work every single day and do a great job uh, under very difficult circumstances. Uh, but prosecuting, if you can do it honestly, uh, there is no other job quite like it. Briefly tell us about a case that took you 22 years to finalize. You say that at times it even tested your temper. Oh yes, it certainly tested my temper often. Um, the accused was a particularly difficult uh, man who, who was a, a very senior advocate. So he knew his way around the law and the courts and he used every opportunity possible to delay the matter. Um, often successfully, hence it took 22 years to finalize. Uh, 22 years was almost my entire adult life in the criminal justice system. Um, the case itself wasn't that interesting. It was, you know, a commercial crime is not um, juicy or fascinating. It's, it's, it's different, it takes longer to do, it's often tedious. Uh, I find it interesting, but many people don't. Um, so the facts of the case were not that fascinating. It was just a, a, a fraud, uh, theft and uh, statutory offences. Uh, related largely to um, contraventions of the Banks Act, um, but uh, but it 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 was a I think it's still the longest ever trial. Uh, I don't think anybody will easily overtake it. I sincerely hope not. It's not ideal for a case to last for 22 years. Um, I think I say in my book at some points I fervently hoped that the accused would die, but eventually I became so tired of the matter that I didn't even mind if it was me that died, just as long as someone died. <laughs> And your interest in politics was sparked by the well-known anti-apartheid campaigner Helen Suzman. What 
attracted you to to Helen Suzman in this way? Well, I was interested in Helen Suzman more than in politics. Uh, I didn't really have more than a, a passing interest in politics more than any other citizen in South Africa had. Um, I certainly couldn't have described myself as a political activist. Um, but Helen Suzman interested me because she was, uh, because I knew her, but not well, but I did know her. And um, she was a, a small woman in stature. Uh, she, when I got to know her, she was no longer a young woman. And she was then still, but had been for many years, the only woman in our parliament. Uh, and for many years, the only, uh, let's say, progressive member of parliament. Uh, so the only liberal. In, in a sea of male-dominated conservative politics, and uh, which I admired. Uh, the fact that she kept quiet for no one. This really little old lady uh, went there and fought for what she believed in and stood up for the rest of us on her own. I, I admire that, that, that sort of strength that she had, yeah. When the ANC decided to appoint the Director of Public Prosecutions as a political appointment, you described this as having been a political compromise. Please elaborate on what you meant by this. Well, it was a, it was a compromise in that, in the run-up to the 1994 elections and the, the new constitution. Um, you know, during Codessa, they were, were, were redesigning a lot of state institutions uh, of necessity. Um, and while everybody was terribly excited about 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 Cadessa, about the possibility of of having um, free and fair elections that were democratic, that everybody could participate in, uh, that, that we were, I'm sure, I'm, I'm not sure that you were born yet then, but uh, but but you know, people of my generation were terribly excited about the fact that we could leave this this past behind us and move on. Uh, and but the compromise was that the the, the there was never an NPA. It's a, it's a new institution that was designed by the constitution. So the criminal justice system fell under the auspices of the Department of Justice, and the head of criminal prosecutions was um, the Attorney General, of which there were five, and they reported uh, administratively to the Minister of Justice, uh, bearing in mind that Parliament was the highest lawmaking body in South Africa then, and not the constitution. And operationally, they were independent. And at that time, I personally knew all five. And I can tell you that, without any shadow of a doubt, that they would not have stood for any interference of an improper nature in their domain. Uh, so when Cadessa was on the go, and, uh, and the, it became clear that the structure of the NPA, which, into which the Department of Justice the prosecuting component would be absorbed, uh, would have a, a new tier of, um, of authority uh, in the form of what we then refer to as the super attorney general. So there would be the ordinary attorneys general and on top of them would sit a super attorney general which later became known as the national director. And the new tier under him was designed for deputy national directors of which there are five. So instead of the attorneys general being who are now directors of public prosecutions, being the, the final layer in the criminal justice system, two new layers were added. Um, and the deputy national directors uh, are not necessarily political appointments, although they are appointed by the president. Um, but the, the attorney, the, the national director, the super attorney general, uh, it was insisted that um, as part of a, a compromise of the structure, that that would be a political appointment and it would be the president's prerogative. Uh, and it worried us then. Uh, it was a matter of concern and we said, what will happen if uh, you appoint somebody who then interferes politically in prosecutions or allows political interference in the prosecution services? And of course it was the time of Nelson Mandela and, every, and it was a euphoric time. Everybody was... We wanted to, everybody wanted to make it work so badly that, that everybody made compromises from both sides, from all sides. And, and this was one of them that shouldn't have been made. Um, because, of course, while, while Nelson Mandela was the president, it's inconceivable 
uh, that he would do anything dishonorable. Uh, but I don't think anybody foresaw that we could go from Nelson Mandela to a Jacob Zuma in 22 years. Yeah. And do you think that the NPA can be fixed? Yes. Um, I certainly think the NPA can be fixed. Uh, it's a top-down organization. It needs a leader with integrity. Uh, whoever is the NDPP who fixes it will have to have a lot of courage. Uh, we'll have to have a great work ethic. Uh, his level of integrity will have to be unquestionable. But we have such a man. He was the NDPP before. His name is Vusi Pikoli. He can fix it. With regards to the arms deal, you said that if the NPA does not prosecute President Jacob Zuma, civil society will. Why do you trust civil society to carry such an uphill task? Well, civil society has proved itself in the last uh, 10 years. They've um, fought many battles on behalf of you and I and won. They've spent a lot of time, money and effort of their own fighting those battles and, and they've won. Um, the DA has done an unbelievably good job, and that's not because I'm a member of it, but the DA has done a magnificent job in what the President likes to refer to as warfare, yeah. uh, a lawfare, yeah. and, uh, and it's not only the DA, the Helen Susman Foundation, Freedom Under Law, uh, more recently ATA, uh, they fight battles on behalf of ordinary citizens and they win. Yeah. And I've got absolute faith that uh, if, if the NPA does not do its job, uh, civil society will. Former head of the NPA, Vusi Pikoli, described you as tough but fair. What was your relationship like with him? I think we had a very good relationship. I, as I say, when he came to the NPA, I didn't know him. Uh, he was from the Department of Justice and he was the Director General and I had never met him. Uh, we were all a little concerned because we all become very fond of uh, Bulalani. Yeah. Uh, and I thought Bulalani was a good National Director and, and we were sorry to see him go especially under the circumstances under which he left. Um, but uh, Vusi Pikoli arrived and he settled in and he just did such a good job. Uh, there was nothing about him to not like. He worked hard, he had integrity, he had a great work ethic. Uh, he gave us credibility. Um, he just gave the organization direction. It was the most wonderful time and he was the most marvelous person to work for. And I have the, only the highest regard for him. The DA seems to be spending a lot of time in court instead of showing us what it is capable of. How would you respond to such an observation? It's true that we spend a lot of time in court, but you can see what we're doing. Uh, we, we lost it, well, we didn't lose it the other day, but it was, we got a stay, so it's postponed. But um, generally speaking, we've won 99% uh, of the litigation that we've undertaken. And it's been public interest litigation. So it's, uh, litigation in the interests of you and I and each time it's done to enforce a constitutional imperative uh, which improves the lives and entrenches the constitution of every South African so that is what we're doing and you can see it and everybody should be very grateful as I say also to Freedom Under Law to uh, the Helen Susman Foundation to Alta and to other um, public interest organizations that litigate at great expense because believe me it's not cheap to litigate. Um, but for people who think the DA is doing nothing, um, I think in Parliament we add a lot of value in the legislative process, uh, trying to ensure that uh, legislation that, that passes is the best that we can make it, given the circumstances. Um, we try our very best, along with the other opposition parties, to hold the ANC to account. And sometimes we do, it's difficult, bearing in mind the majority that they have. Um, and if you look at the, the three metros where the DA governs, um, I, I challenge you to tell me that you haven't noticed the difference in Johannesburg. Um, I can tell you that in, in my constituency in Pretoria, there's a huge difference. Um, Nelson Mandela Bay gets better every single day. And the Western Cape is the best run metro in the country and has been for years. So that's just not true. You can see what the DA does. And lastly, what is working in Parliament like for you? It's uh, mostly enjoyable, uh, sometimes dreadfully boring, uh, but mostly enjoyable. It, uh, it enables you to again help people, make a difference in people's lives. Um, and the legislative process is very, very rewarding. So uh, 
generally speaking, I, I enjoy the job and I'm not at all sorry that I chose to go there. That was Glynis Breitenbach speaking to Krimamedia's Polity about her memoir titled Rule of Law.